Welcome to Circe 2015. Uh, I'm here with uh, John Hodges, and we're going to talk about classical education. Wonderful. Glad to see you. Good to have you. What is your one or two sentence definition of a classical education? Oh my goodness, classical education, huh? The big, the big basic question. A classical education is an education based on the, the great writers and thinkers of the past, and we are to sort of stand on their shoulders. We're supposed to be uh, learning what we can from the past. It's a, in fact, it's a, um, it's a proper, uh, a proper application of the fifth commandment, I think, which is to honor your mother and father. Not only your biological mother and father, but your spiritual mother and father, your cultural mother and father. We're supposed to be taking the past seriously and uh, gr grow from, from that. So we look at the great books and art and music and philosophy and, uh, and, uh, grow from how it is that they taught their kids, their children. It's the classical education is the, um, is the handing down of the important things from one generation to the next. That's what education is supposed to be. And classical education is supposed to be that understanding of the history that we're handing down, that, that, um, that uh, inheritance that, we, that we're given. OK, thank you. So you mentioned you're handing down, and you mentioned the subjects. Right. Um, uh, what are those in a more specific way to us in the West? Uh, so, you know, what are we handing down? Um, uh, you know, we've talked about great books. You know, what are those great books? And um, what are some of the greatest books that we need to be, uh, or subjects, great books, right. um, thoughts? Um, what do we hold dear that we're handing down to our children? Well, first and foremost, of course, is the Christian heritage that we have. That doesn't get handed down naturally. It has to be taught. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the, the great writers and thinkers, as I just mentioned, the, um, the go back, going back to the Greeks and to the Romans and to the early church and to uh, the high Middle Ages and to uh, um, everything that's come in what we call the modern world from the Renaissance onward. So um, it's reading the epic poems of Homer and uh, uh, Dante and the, the great works of theologians like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Boethius and uh, the mathematics and the, well, the seven arts. I mean, the, uh, the great books are, um, are, the, are the ones that lay out for us the trivium and the quadrivium as well. So we have uh, books that teach us about language, about the trivium, and we have books that teach us about numbers, uh, the quadrivium. And the combination of those two, I think, actually, are uh, the best way, and the Christians in the Middle Ages thought this way, that uh, the best way to, uh, to teach that, uh, that revelation that God has given us. So God has revealed himself to us in words, mm -hmm. right, in the scripture. And so uh, we need to know how to, how to handle words, to make sense of them, to understand what a metaphor is, to understand uh, what grammar is. How is it that we're supposed to make sense of this revelation in words? But then God has also revealed himself in the world around us. The creation around us is, a, is what they call general revelation, right? right. And, and uh, in order to be able to make sense of that, we want to uh, be able to understand numbers. Numbers are the ways to, to unlock the, the secrets of, uh, of, the, of the general revelation of the world. So okay. the heavens are telling the glory of God as well as the Bible, see? And uh, uh, so special revelation, you can't count on general revelation to save your soul, but it is a revelation of God, right? Because the, the heavens are telling of his glory. And if we're going to make sense of that, then we want to be able to handle numbers. And so we have the arts and the books that speak about those arts are what we want to hand down to the next generation to train them up to be able to make sense of things, to think well, to think clearly. Um, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but then you can add on that fear, uh, given that, that awe, I mean, uh, you know, uh, all the great things that, uh, that man has, has taught so far. Mm, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the trivium and the quadrivium, yep. and a lot of people um, have heard and could even explain the basics of the trivium, but um, I think that the understanding of the quadrivium is, is, is a lot harder oh, uh, for your average, especially the homeschoolers that I run into. Could you unpack 
what the quadrivium is. You explained the trivium as word, right? And the quadrivium as number. That's right. Um, so could you unpack specifically the quadrivium as number? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, the the four parts of the quadrivium are arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And they are each they each have to do with numbers, right? The arithmetic are the functions of adding, subtracting, sub multiplying, dividing, and so on, uh, and the basic properties of numbers and so on. Um, uh, geometry has to do with uh, the way uh, shapes interact. Uh, so you have plane plane geometry and solid geometry, and um, and then you and the, and that has to do with how numbers work. Uh, then you have astronomy, which is in many ways the the, uh, the measurement of distance. Um, you want to know how far it is to the sun, for example. Um, so you, you have, to, have to know something about astronomy in order to be able to make sense of the, of the largeness of the, of the solar system, the largeness of the universe, um, and all the numbers that are associated with largeness. Well then, music, um, my favorite because I'm a musician, is, uh, is actually a numbers racket. It's a numbers game, as it were. Uh, no, music has to do with ratios. Hmm. Music has to do with how numbers fit together uh, in, in, in uh, unit fractions, one half or two thirds or four fifths or something. And uh, music is the way that uh, those ratios are actually sounded. You can hear ratios because of the way that uh, uh, things vibrate in the world, strings, columns of air, um, and so on. We, we, uh, God has made the world to vibrate a certain way, and when, he, when we discover that, then we discover something about the way ratios work, too. So unit fractions in music actually sound consonant to our ears. It's a strange yeah. thing. So the, the music actually then gets, uh, becomes a kind of a, a doorway from the quadrivium into uh, other aspects of, of thought, like philosophy and theology and so on, because the, the idea of harmony, the idea of ratios in music, uh, can be metaphorically extended to an awful lot of the rest of the world. Okay. The, the harmony of a good business relationship, metaphorically, the right. harmony of a, of a good marriage, the harmony of, uh, Plato talked about the harmony of justice, hmm. that the, the notion of a person in, a, in, a, in a, a just city would do X and the city would respond with Y. Uh, and the, those two things should be in harmony with each other. If I, if I am a citizen and I do something heroic, the, uh, the city ought to throw me a, uh, you know, a celebration. They ought, to, they ought to give me a medal or something. If I do something that is unvirtuous, then they ought to penalize me somehow, you know, and, that the, and the punishment ought to fit the crime. Uh, and so there's a kind of harmony between the, the action of the, of the person and the reaction of the polis, the city. Uh, and that's what makes uh, justice in the world. That's what just, just behavior is. So justice is a kind of harmony. Just a kind of harmony, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, of the, the quadrivium, it seems like there's a, um, there's subjects that are often associated with specialty, so uh, specialty or giftedness. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are um, gifted with math or mm -hmm. gifted with music, um, or, or you know, or interested in astronomy. You know, there's, um, and it. But you're describing this as the part of an education, if I'm understanding you correctly, that every person should have. Right. Um, could you talk right. about the, you know, perhaps the specialization that um, people think of today and how, oh, they have a kind of a, uh, a certain choosing of one over the other, mm -hmm. and specifically how would uh, every student learn these? How does that, what does that look like? In other words, uh, mus musicians in particular, you know, if someone says, I, I just can't, Sing. I can't understand music. Oh, I see. Do, do, do they right. need to? Right. How do they learn music as part of a well-rounded education for every man? Sure. Well, I think all of us are uh, gifted at different levels with different abilities and so on. But the the purpose of the quadrivium isn't to figure out what your uh, your gifting is all about. Uh, the purpose of the quadrivium is to be able to understand something about the nature of the world. Okay. And so if somebody wants to learn something about the nature of the world, wants to know how it is that the world works, he's got to deal with numbers. He's got to be able to deal with numbers. This is, this is basic for, uh, 
uh, for a, a thoughtful person, you see. So it really doesn't have anything to do with your gifting. That doesn't mean that say that some people aren't going to excel at geometry other than others, right? I mean, some, some are going to be better at music than others. But when I'm talking about music as a part of the quadrivium, I'm not talking about playing the violin or the singing or piano, being able to carry a tune. Um, in fact, <laughs> in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, the word musician wasn't used for performers. Performers huh. were performers. They were kind of trained apes. They could do things that other people couldn't do. You know, they worked in hard, hard enough to be able to play the violin. Okay, well, that's great, but you're not a musician. Um, and they didn't use musician to describe composers either. The huh. word musician didn't have anything to do with composers. Composers were sort of spooky geniuses that could hear melodies and pull them out of the air and write them down and so on. But they were, they were geniuses. They were artists, but they weren't com uh, musicians. The word musician was reserved for people who understood the math of it all. Okay. Yeah, and so they read Pythagoras. See, and Pythagoras had written a great deal about, has written, a, did write a, a great deal about, uh, about ratios and proportions in sound. And so uh, it's really all about the, the unit fractions. It's all about the overtone series and the way things are divided up, strings and winds and so on uh, are divided up. And that's something that you teach like you might teach arithmetic, you see. So we don't expect that our you know, third grader, when he's learning the, the mathematical tables, the, the, uh, what do you call them, the, uh, the, multiplication. the multiplication tables is what I meant to say. Multiplication tables, you don't expect him to say, you don't say, well, you don't have to learn this because you're not really going to be good at math or something. Right. No, you teach it to him because it's just basic stuff to know, you know, and that's how it is with this too, I think. Um, it should be understood that the world is a harmonious place and that and that uh, you, if you don't recognize that, are actually going to miss out on some of what, uh, what life, is, is go life is going on about you. You, know, you won't be looking for harmony uh, in the world. So, the, in other words, the goal of learning uh, music is to learn the science of harmony, to That's learn right. to see harmony in the world. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, yeah, Plato uh, explains, uh, actually has a long bit in the symposium and, in the, and re refers to it again in the, in the Republic, where he says it's good for us to teach um, music to young people, play, play beautiful tunes to young people before they think very well, when they're very young, uh, so that their hearts get attached to harmony. They like harmony. They find joy in it. And then when they get older, when they are started to think about things, they can understand something about why they like it, because that's when you teach them about the quadrivium and so on. But more than that, they are, they, as they grow, they begin to look for harmony in everything that they're doing, like the things I mentioned, a good business deal or a good marriage or a good, uh, a, a just society, see? And Plato's argument was, in the Republic was, uh, we want a just society, and one of the ways to get that is to teach music to our children early on so that they love harmony, so that they look for justice and they're not satisfied without it when they're, when they're older. Okay. That's a big part of their education. Okay, well that's very helpful. Especially when you're thinking about sh that the education is for the purposes of shaping the soul. Right. You see? Shaping the soul to love things that are worth loving. Right? And harmony is worth loving inherently. Right. Um, so, uh, edu if education is for the purposes of training in virtue, you know, training in, in uh, uh, the soul to, to sort of get the, the Augustinian uh, hierarchy of value, that, that order of loves, you right. know, ordo amoris we talk yeah. about, uh, then, uh, then education has to be about training them to recognize and appreciate and love uh, beautiful things early beautiful on. Things. Yeah. Okay, so if the goal of uh, um, music is harmony, uh, the goal of arithmetic would be counting. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the goal of as astronomy? Hmm. Well, I want to say to be able to see something of the music of the spheres. There's, there's an order to the creation, okay. you know? And I guess it sort of bleeds over into music a little because it's sure. harmony again, because everything turns into harmony eventually. But um, Perspective of yeah, the universe? Yeah, and seeing... Yeah, seeing the way things relate to one another, how this orbit and that orbit work, or this, you know, how, how gravity changes the direction of this thing, or uh, how do we deal with these long distances and relate uh, gravitational pull as opposed to thrust. It has a lot of physics that you can draw from, a, from astronomy. Okay. Uh, the, way, the way bodies uh, 
relate in in gravity and relationship to one another, magnetism, right. and various things like that. Right, and, so, that's, and that seems to relate to geometry as well. So the goal of geometry would be the relation of of shapes. shapes yeah, that is to one another. Right angles, right triangles, or the the way that squares work, or uh, what uh, the Pythagorean theorem was all about. Uh, uh, what um, um, what not only that, but actually a kind of bit of logic involved because right. ordering our minds. That's right. That's right. And you, and you you have axioms or you have principles that are unprovable that you have to just take on the front front end, right? Post, postulates, I guess they right. call them. And then uh, uh, and then f there are conclusions that you can draw from the combination of those things that are logical. Uh, logically uh, required. So the basic of Valid. logic and reason. That's right. Okay. I think you see a lot of that in the in the manipulation of two dimensional and three dimensional uh, objects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That, I think oh, that sure. really helped to unpack uh, what people hear as a term. I don't think it's very often unpacked. That was very right. helpful. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. And let me move on to one of these. So oh, that, that okay. was, great. was that helpful? That was very helpful. Okay. I enjoyed that a lot. Many of our viewers feel inadequate to teach classically. Hmm. How would you respond to that? Wow, that's a great point. I, I don't know that any of us it feels adequate teaching classically, partly because none of us were taught this way ourselves, right? right? We're really trying to rebuild something that has been lost. So um, I think I heard someone else say that, uh, quoting Chesterton, saying, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Well, we're doing it badly, <laughs> sorry, but but it's so worth doing. We have to give it a try, right? So I think the the uh, the only thing to do is to do the best we can and pray for God's guidance and uh, and hope that the next generation can build on that and and like that. It's a multi generational project. How should parents and teachers who wish to teach classically educate themselves? Well. There's a need for all of us to read extensively, of course. So we have to, we have to. We're always looking for um, books to read that will help us understand better uh, how to how to do this. Not just how to teach, but but what what to teach, what ideas to teach. Um, but on top of that, I think we uh, we call on each other. You know, we're we're a community, and so we meet for conferences and we discuss uh, these sorts of elements when we do. Um, it's not an easy job to be trained classically. I, I helped start a school in Memphis many years ago, and uh, the question came up, you know, where are we going to find teachers that can do this? How can we hire teachers that can do this? And the answer was always, we aren't going to find them. We're going to have to train them. <laughs> so right. we started with people who saw a vision and wanted to be able to do it but didn't know how right. and slowly built them up to be able to uh, to be able to do the job, it's not an easy job, and especially in uh, in when parents are homeschooling, I know it's very intimidating to be able to do what we call a classical education when we haven't had it ourselves or any right. kind of, and a lot of times feel kind of isolated too. So it's very important to get in touch with other people that are doing it and read extensively, read. but also talk with them and find out what they're doing and and relate to one another. All right, and, it's a community and thing. this may be a, a, a hard question to answer, but um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of parents have the desire. You know, they hear you say you need to read, you need to right. connect, you need to have a community, and yet they are they've got you know several kids and a job and right. need and life and you know right. funds are tight because all those kids eat. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> so right. what would you, uh, what advice would you give them when they say, I, you know, I'm just not finding time and I'm tired at night uh, to, to learn and to read and to connect? Yeah. Wow. I think that we have to say humbly that the responsibility for the training of the next generation is actually the, on the parents. Right. And we think that our success is going to be gauged by how well we did with our career or something like that. Right. And how much money we have, you know, um, how much prestige we have in the culture or whatever. But really, I think we're going to be judged on how well we've trained our, our children. So it may mean that we're doing too many other things and we have to reprioritize a little bit. 
sure, I'd like to be working for this big company that needs me to be out of town, you know, three weeks out of the month, and it means that I'm not able to teach my kids like I'd like to. Well, maybe I need to turn that down. It right. may be. So, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying right. it may be. Uh, and same thing with uh, anything else that takes up our time and our, our energies. We're right. exhausted all the time, I know. But it may be because we're trying to do everything and we have to do a couple of things well instead of 15 things poorly, you know. So it means examining the priorities right. and then uh, making decisions on what are the top, on those top priorities. That's right. So, That's right. Um, you know, you mentioned reading um, uh, uh, and, and, and connecting. So, but, uh, you know, especially on, on the reading, this, this will kind of go into what is the greatest book. Oh, I, that okay. might come into oh, that right. question. Okay. But, um, uh, you know, especially for that parent who wants to read, who wants to uh, educate their kids and, and educate themselves. Um, uh, uh, we talked about priorities. Well, what about priorities and what to read? Yeah, you know, sure. So, first sure. of all, what is the greatest book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in your That's opinion. That's impossible, isn't it? Um, yeah, there are so many great ones, and they become your friends, and you read them, and then you put them on the shelf to read again next time, and and over and over and over again, they become your friends. The the the, the Homer books, the the two epics by Homer, the the Shakespeare plays, the the uh, the Milton, uh, Dante. We make a joke at the Center for Western Studies that everything comes back to Dante, <laughs> and in some ways it does. Yeah. Um, uh, the Summa of of Thomas. Um, the uh, um, golly, I, I mean the four quartets. I think are tremendous. You know Eliot's quartets. Hmm. Um, I don't know where I would say. You know, anything is the greatest of books, but... What is your favorite? Wow. Well, I've directed some Shakespeare plays, and so I might say that the Shakespeare plays are my favorites, but, gee, I mean, how, can you, how can you pick one? I, I really sure. have a hard time <laughs> picking one. And beyond that, see, I would say, since I'm an artist, a musician, and also when I teach art and music history, I can't do without the Rembrandt self-portraits, or I can't do without the Bach B minor mass, or the, you know... Right. Uh, so I, in my mind, it wouldn't be only the books that I would take, Not say, to the books. desert island question that everybody right. always asks. You know, how, what would you want on the on a desert island? Well, I would have to have, uh, you know, uh, scores of the of the the Brahms Requiem, you know, and the and the B minor Mass of Bach, and the um, gee, the the symphonies of Mozart, and the and the Prokofiev ballets, and I mean, I could go on and on. It's there's so much there that I can't do without. Such great stuff. Well, it's going to be some desert island. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to have a big library. That's yeah. all there is to that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and a symphony orchestra to play it right, all. That's, that's what right. I was Good. thinking. Yeah, uh, right. All of the uh, necessary, take... uh, yeah, the pianoforte. <laughs> that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. Drop yeah. that in. <laughs> so we talked about how parents should, uh, and educators who want to teach classically, should educate themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the first step or some of the steps that someone should take to begin teaching more classically. Mm, mm. Uh, so once they've educated themselves, uh, I guess incorporating that with their kids. Sure. Um, that's a great question. I would say that learning about what the Socratic method is would help. And by that I mean, um, it. I think real real learning happens not so much by dictating to the student what he needs to learn, although there is some of that, mm -hmm. but in exposing the student to something and then having a, asking a lot of questions of the student. In other words, you're not just teaching the student the, the, the subject that you're teaching him. You're kind of using the subject you're teaching him to teach him how to think well. See, mm -hmm. because what you want in the end is not simply a student that knows everything, you because that's not possible, right? But what right. you can do is train his mind to think well, so that when he comes across a new subject on his own in the rest of his life, he can he has the tools to sort of unpack it. He can think through it, you know. Right. So early on, I think what we need to do is learn how to ask questions that lead the students to the truth. Not manipulatively, but honestly. That is, 
questions that ask him where he is right now and see where he is right now and ask him where he would go from there to find the thing and when he goes in the wrong direction don't just correct him let him see the consequences of that wrong direction and let him come to the realization that he needed to go a different way in that early part so you, that's what you're teaching him kind of how to map out a way a strategy to address things you know and in certain directions are usually not very fruitful so others were going to be and and you get that by by asking the student questions and probing and probing and probing until he uh, is able to uh, to give answer for why he took this, the the position he he took. You see, now that doesn't mean that you aren't going to lecture. We we sure. do lecture. We have to teach things because they don't they need something to think about and yeah and all. Right. But the goal is simply is not simply to uh, to uh, to teach them information. The goal is to train their souls to attach themselves to the good, the true, and the beautiful when they come across it, you see. Right. And I think you best do that by, uh, by getting, in a sense, getting into his head. Right. You know? okay. Now, that requires that the teacher think pretty thoroughly about the subject before he teaches it. And this, I know, is very intimidating to people who are just... The be first part of your question was, you know, people are worried about how to go about teaching classically, right. and, yeah. and it's intimidating to think about starting that. But in order to do a good Socratic dis d discussion, you can do it with one-on-one, -on -one, you can do it with one-on-a-group, you know, in a group. Uh, you know, in a group. Um, you have to be able to know the subject well enough so that you can follow the rabbit trail a ways without falling outside of your sphere of knowledge, you see. Right. And you're not just going to teach them the one little route you want them to take. You're going to lay out a whole world for them to explore, and you have to be able to meet them wherever they are in that little, that little area. I hope I'm not being too abstract. Does that make sense? No, no, that's helpful. It, I, the the follow-up question I was going to ask is, is so, you know, if you know enough about the subject, you can somewhat guide a student. Right. Is there a way to use the Socratic method um, uh, when you're teaching yourself, So you know, that mm -hmm. question of answer uh, uh, yourself, when you don't know the scope of the land? Um, well, that's why you read. Or do you have to know that? So that, okay, the that's answer is That's why you read. read. You want to you wanna know a lot more about it than the student that you're ta talking to. Right. But most of all, you want to be able to, I, I think of it as kind of getting inside his head and tinkering with the with the the mechanism almost that's an unfortunate metaphor but a, a the kind of way of thinking the way one addresses something right. do you just think in terms of what makes you feel good when you go or do you have some kind of logical bones and structure do you know what a syllogism is right. could you reduce whatever argument we we're talking about to a syllogism and show right. how it's valid and could you you know things like that and and in doing that you're giving tools i think to the to the student to be able to get a hold of things that he doesn't know and he will be able to continue to do that when you're not there that's the goal right. you see you want him to continue with the rest of his life being a learner learner right. Right. So I hope that helps. No, uh, that helps. And uh, what are some of the ways that educators and, you know, especially parents who have not been formally trained, you know, they're, they're teaching their kids, um, learn how to, how to conduct this. So it's one, the first part is to learn the terrain, right. you know, so that you can lead them. This, what would be, um, uh, uh, how can we, we, they learn how to teach Socratically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, I don't know. Um, read the, the Plato's dialogues and imitation. see how he does it. <laughs> Certainly imitation. Yeah. Uh, so you see other people do it. But also, you know, you, you, you as an adult speaking to a, a child, a young person, um, and, and have in your mind a kind of understanding of the, of the cosmos, God's way, of, that God made the world the way it is, that it's knowable, that, it's, that it can be made, you can make sense of it when you discover things, you're going to discover real things, you know, you're, you, there's a, there's a, there's a, there are two parts it seems to me about knowing that, that don't have anything to do with the kind of scientific knowledge that we think of as knowledge these days. Right. They, they are that the world is knowable and that your mind has the ability to grasp it in some way. And those two things can't be proven by the scientific method. They have mm. to be taken on faith. Right. See? So if you have those two pieces in place, then you can even explore areas that you don't know very well yourself and ask questions along the way. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. And if you come to a point where you 
you see, hmm, I wonder what this is, and you don't know what the answer is yourself, and you ask your student and he doesn't know what the answer is, then maybe the two of you then go and try and do some research about it and go on okay. from there. You can, it's perfectly legitimate for a teacher to say, you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. Maybe we should do a little more thinking about it, or right. we know, let's, who, where would we go to find out more kind right. of thing, right? And that, that'll be very common with people who are just starting out. Absolutely, so that absolutely. Is, okay. In that way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, so learn refrain to, from yeah. doing it until I had it all down. I can't do that right, either, okay. right? So right. the same sort of limitations that the student's going to have, we are going to have as teachers as well. Except hopefully we have a little more, you know, experience and so on. Right. So that goes back to to reading. You 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 right. try to read ahead when you ask the Socratic questions, and then you you read when you bump into answers you or questions you can't answer. That's right. Okay. That's right. And they're always going to be those. Perfectly legitimate thing to say is, I don't know. Yeah. That's a fine thing to say. And actually, for the student to see you say that is probably healthy, too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it doesn't think, yeah. well, you're some kind of Superman or something. Nobody knows everything. Yeah, right? especially for mom and dad. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. That can be life-changing for a kid to see mom and dad and say, well, I don't know, but we can find out. Right. That's, you know, that's a great thing. Yeah. Oh, I don't have to already know all that stuff. <laughs> Great. And you don't always all know everything? Right. Life is okay. There's, right. That's a good, I think that's healthy. Good. Well, thank you. Sure. And then I have that one last question okay. that, um, okay. If you could go to dinner with any three educators, who would they be? <laughs> wow. Wow. I would like to talk to Augustine, St. Augustine about, well, lots of things, but about, in particular, about music, since mm. I'm interested in that. And he wrote six books on music. And, really? Yeah, and he wanted to write more, I understand. They were all about rhythm, but he wanted to write more about melody and harmony, and, I, and he never did, so I uh, never got around to it. So I'd love to talk to him about that. That would be great fun. Who else would I like to have dinner with? Golly, I assume you're talking about people that are gone because there's a lot of people that are alive right now that I would want to go and see. Well, it could be either one. Either way, okay. <laughs> Gee. Um, hmm. It would be fascinating to sit down and just listen to uh, Thomas Aquinas think, <laughs> to talk. I would be delighted to hear him and to, I mean, all I'd have to do is sit and listen with Augustine too for that. <laughs> I, I heard the story, uh, Wes Callahan actually recently oh, yeah. told the story of uh, that Thomas Aquinas would be um, dining with, uh, uh, in the castle with some, I don't know if it was a king or a prince, I, and I forget which one it was, but that he would uh, be eating and kind of in his own thoughts and suddenly he would uh, just slam his fist down on the table and say, and that's the answer. And, you know, he had just been thinking through uh, some yes. great thought in his head. Yes. And, and uh, that it was something that the, uh, uh, whoever that monarch was, um, appreciated about him. I mean, he, he would come on and just think at his table. So, yeah, I would enjoy watching that as Boy, well. Boy, <laughs> I would love to just let him talk and or just watch him until he figured it out and then ask him questions about yeah, it. Yeah, hear the conclusion at yeah. least. Yeah, so he's right, doing that right. whole Socratic method all in his head. In his head. <laughs> wow. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have to, when I first became a Christian, I... Uh, read Lewis, C.S. Lewis, mm. as so many did, and I thought at the time, I had no idea who he was or where he was or anything, uh, and I thought, gee, you know, if, if I could go and study with this guy, I would, I would quit everything I'm doing. You know, at the time I was studying conducting, I was a musician and conductor, and I thought, I, that's what I live for, I love conducting, but I would give it all up in a second if he would teach me anything he wanted to teach me. If he said, you know what I, you need to learn? You need to learn nuclear fusion. I would say, aye, aye, sir. You know, he, <laughs> I was just that impressed with everything he thought, you know. So it took me some time to find out that he had been dead for many years by the time I was reading him, you know. But I thought if he was alive, boy, I sure would like to go and study with him. Yeah. Uh, anything he wanted to teach. So, so I, I guess, guess those are Lewis three. Is the third. Yeah. yeah, maybe Lewis would be the third. Very brilliant, good. brilliant mind. Chesterton, good heavens. T.S. Eliot, yeah. that'd be great. Anyway, there are lots of people. I look forward to it. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you very much. My great pleasure. It. Oh, my, my honor. Yeah. Thanks for having me in.